Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you were compelled to worship. It's a joy to worship with you this morning. Um, to be able to come together and just sing praise to God. Uh, I, hope, I pray He's lifted high by um, all, we, all we sing to Him. I pray that your heart is centered on Him this morning. As I begin to preach each, more, uh, each Sunday, I have my iPad set on airplane mode. And so that blocks out most things. I do that because my brother one time tried to FaceTime call me in the middle of a sermon. So that was exciting. And, uh, but it doesn't shut off notifications. And just now I have uh, at 10 a.m. all like the past several weeks set to pray for VBS. And so it just popped up right now. And so we say we do that. We had a second ago all the volunteers stand. What I would love for us to do is everybody else stand And let's pray over them. Let's just take a moment as we pray for this this wonderful week that we're about to have. So if you're working there, please stay seated so the people around you can pray over you. Join me, will you? Father God, we praise you for the opportunity of sharing your word this week. As my brothers and sisters in Christ all around lift holy hands over those who are going to be serving God, we pray for endurance. We pray for joy. There may be tough conversations or frustration, logistical issues. Things may happen this week, God, that that could steal joy away from this wonderful privilege that it is in you. So God, I pray right now that you help all the workers serve diligently with the end in mind that this week a kid could pass from death to life because they're re- introduced to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God, we ask for that. We ask for it ten times o- over. We ask for it so abundantly like, like fish in a net that our nets burst and only you can contain it. God, we pray for your spirit to reign powerfully. We pray for unity and harmony all centered on your son. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you'll continue to pray for VBS workers this week. And um, if you're connected to one of them, check in on them. Maybe do something nice for them as, as they're serving. And um, encourage them this week. Just send them a message. Uh, let them know you appreciate them. So we're excited for that to start. We're going to go ahead and start in our word with uh, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Now, as we've gone through... First John, we're going to be covering verses 7 through 21 this week. Now, that may seem like a lot for those of you who've been in my messages. I'm not entirely sure I can cover that many me- uh, verses. What do I have, an hour to preach? Is that what I usually go? So we'll see how that goes. But John, he's been talking about a lot of different things. He's talked really in chapters 1 and 2. He talked frequently about sin and um, people who were saying that it's okay to sin, or, or they just had a misunderstanding about sin. In chapter 3, he really, again, dove into righteousness, that if you know God, you're going to pursue righteousness. And then chapter 3, that was uh, verses 1 through 10, and then after that, he goes into a talk on love. And then he talks about an anointing that um, some people have the anointing of the Antichrist, and, and he says they must con- someone must confess Christ, they must be consistent with his word, otherwise there's a different anointing. And now we're going to go to John's longest section on love. This is actually the third time he's talked on love in this little tiny book of just five chapters. He has three entire sections where he talks about love. I think he's trying to say something to us. And you may be one who wonders, can God's love make a difference to me? Now, maybe you, you wonder that because maybe you just don't believe that he loves you or, or you don't think it matters. Or maybe you think you believe that he loves people, but not you specifically. You just may not think that it's that important or it's not directed at you. I, uh, as we were prepping for VBS, as you can see in the hallways, the ladies have done a lot of work. And they let me do a few things. And one of those, they, uh, they asked me, it should seem pretty harmless, they gave me a box and said, just wrap this with white paper and they're going to put little black dots on it and, um, and it's going to be a dice. Well, I'll leave it to you all to go find the one that I did. 
<laughs> but I've gotten a few comments that maybe it wasn't the best, and uh, I'm sure it kind of crossed their mind whether or not they need to redo that or not, and then they didn't let me wrap anything else the rest of the week. So uh, I, Danielle knows that I, I do not like wrapping presents. Ever since Amazon made the little checkbox, you can just have it sent to you gift wrap. Yes, please. That's what I do every time. But they didn't ultimately care about that box that much because, one, there's a lot of other boxes and they could hide it somewhere and it just becomes background. But also just one, one little thing, it's not that significant, right? Just, just one decoration among all the other decorations, it's not that significant. And sometimes I think that we think of God's love that way, that it's not that significant. That maybe the Bible teaches that he loves, but either it's not significant because I don't, I don't fully believe it, or I don't think it matters, or I don't think it applies to me. And that's what we're going to go through today in these scripture passages that talk about God and his love for us and whether or not it makes a difference. So let's start in 1 John chapter 4 and look at verse 7 with me, please. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. We're going to section these together. I'm going to go through verses 7 through 11 and kind of see some themes that we see in here. In this first theme, I want to talk to the person that love doesn't come easy to. That it's It's kind of a difficult thing, or maybe you like the idea of love in theory, but in practice, when I talk to someone or do something for someone, it's just a lot more difficult. uh, I've talked about my calling, my calling to ministry, and really as I share my testimony because I came to Christ early, a lot of my testimony is just God essentially making me surrender to the call of ministry, that I tried a whole lot of other things uh, for good reason. One, I'm introverted. Most pastors, it seems like, there's some that are really, there's some that are really extroverted and they don't mind the spotlight, things like that. But I've met a lot of the analytical types of pastors that we just as soon like be in the background and for some reason God wants us to preach. And if a bunch of people, if more people could come to the cross by me being in the background, I would much rather do that, right? If, if he didn't need me to teach his word or ask me to teach his word, he doesn't need me. But if he didn't call me to do that, then then I wouldn't want to if more people could come to the cross the other way. So I have that introverted side, public speaking. Man, when I first started public speaking and having to do that, horrified. It's just a terrifying thing. I remember some of my first baptisms, my heart was beating so, so hard that I was actually short of breath. I was that anxious. The only other time I feel like that happened is one time when me and a snake had a fight and... (laughs) It turns out it wasn't a poisonous one, but it came at me, and it it was terrifying. And I'm not one of those uh, snake-handling Christians, so I knew that (laughs) it was me or it. So I had all those reasons. I also have confessed from this pulpit that uh, my dad, I had seen him. He was a pastor, and I had seen him have some real difficulty with people in the church, and I just didn't want that. I didn't want to be a pastor. I I didn't feel like my giftedness, my desire. I didn't feel like any of that lined up with being a pastor, but it didn't matter because God called me to it. It doesn't matter if I don't think I was gifted for it or had the personality for it or, or, or whatever, if God calls me to it. I want us to think about that as we look through these verses and say, what if loving people doesn't come easy? What if it doesn't? What if you're that, that type of person that You can be the indifferent person that you just don't care that much for people that it's not that you don't like them. You just, you don't need them. You'd rather be apart from them, mind your own business. Or maybe, maybe it is that you have strong emotions for people and it's negative. That people really get on your nerves. You're impatient to people. The words you say, the things you do, you're harsh toward them or you talk behind their back, or, or do all sorts of things other than love that other person. What if loving people doesn't come easy? We're going to talk as we go through these first verses about four truths to help you love God. So let's look at verse 7. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who's lo- who loves has been born of God and knows God. 
The first thing we need to know about love is love is from God. Now, this isn't the first point in your note. I have like 15 points, so uh, just buckle up. I told you I'm going through a lot of verses here. Love is from God. Imagine me as someone he created saying, but God, love doesn't come easy to me. And God, who created all things, being able to say, yeah, but love is from me. Like you say you're not good at it. You, you, maybe we talk to God like, God, you just don't understand. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't understand. Love is from me. How can I say that I'm someone who serves God, someone who, who looks to, to please Him, to do His will, but I don't love when I know that He is the origin of love? Love's from God. Look at the next verse. The one who does not love does not know God because God is is love. Not only is it from Him, it's His very nature to love. Now what's interesting as you go through Scripture, there's different times that you see where it says God is this. And so some of them are God is light, God is a consuming fire, and God is spirit. So those are all different attributes. It's not saying the only thing God is is love. It's not saying that. It's saying one of His attributes is by His very nature, He is love. Just in the same way as He is spirit, He is light, He is a consuming fire. And that last one ought to have, us ha- have this, this cautious balance, this appropriate balance where we could say, well, God is love, therefore He lets us get away with anything. No, God is also a consuming fire. He's both of those things, but He is love. And so if love is from God and God is love, then me, someone who I might say, love just doesn't come very natural to me, so I might not want to do it. We ought to know that the one who saved us not only is love from Him, but it is His very nature. And if I believe I am, I am His and I have had this nature that's been changed by Him from sinful man to follower of Christ to new creation, and I think that I can be His and not love, this says I'm wrong. Matthew 5, verses 43-44 through 44 says this, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. God calls us to something different. He calls us to something different than the rest of the world where anyone else would say, yeah, love the people who you should love and hate those who hate you. And God says, no, love is from me and I am love. And I expect you to love even those who normally people would hate. Look at the third one. Now we're getting into some just extraordinary powerful verses. Verse 9. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His one and only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Why else should we love? Well, it's from Him. It's His very nature. But it's also because of the cross. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His one and only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Now, I can imagine all sorts of times when, when someone was unloving or unlovable, that, that I just, I have all sorts of good reason not to care for that person, to not like that person, to, to talk about them, to talk disrespectful to them. We can all imagine times when we've had things like that, and we ought to realize that all of Christianity was started by God-loving people who were unlovable. John 3.16, For God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now one thing we gloss over in there is the perishing part. The why we were perishing. He loved me so much that He died for me so that I wouldn't perish. And I was perishing because I was His enemy. Because sin was in my life. Sin had so ruled over me that I was separated from God. We ought not miss that, and you ought not miss that this morning. If you just thought that being good enough could get you to heaven. You shouldn't miss this this morning, that God had to send His Son to die for your sins so that you might be saved if you give your life over and believe in Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. So that's what Romans 5, 8 says. But God proves His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
So this person, like myself maybe, who says love doesn't come easy, I mean, we got to see it's from God. It's of His very nature. It's His work. This is what He, he does for us, is that He loves when we're unlovable. In verse 10, look at it with me. Love consists in this. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. To the person in the room that it's hard to love. Love because He first loved. Sometimes when we think of love as just this emotion, that it's just something I either have or I don't, the Bible dispels that. That's why a passage like 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, it tells us that love is a choice. It's an action. This, as we see in Scripture, is an unconditional love that says, even though you were in sin, even though you were separated from God, He loved you anyway and sent His Son to die to save you. So John 15 says this, As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and remain in His love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. So I want to begin this this lengthy passage with all of these principles or truths about love that we who sometimes get frustrated with people and angry with people and want to talk about people and and do all sorts of things other than love people he tells us that love is from him love is his nature love is his work he did it first and so look at verse 11 dear friends if god loved us in this way we also must love one another so the first point on your notes is God's love is our calling. God's love is our calling. Love like God. Now, we're going to fall short, but that's what he calls us to. He calls us to be of his his work, of his nature, to be in alignment with that. And if we think about, well, okay, I understand that's a a, a biblical thing. Yeah, love sounds good, and, and I just want to pass on. What I don't want you to miss is in this tiny little book, of five chapters. He has three entire sections devoted to telling Christians to love. There's a reason for that. Now, in context, he has people who, who hated and, and said, I can hate someone and, and I'll still have a relationship with God. But it's for you too. God has these things preserved for us so that we can know, we who sometimes do that talking about people or, or speaking hatefully or doing things that aren't loving to people. He's calling you to love. You right there in your seat today, as you're thinking to someone that you haven't forgiven, or someone that you're okay talking down to, or maybe it's your spouse who you don't pursue in love, or maybe there's someone that you feel like they just always do you wrong, they, they just talk to you like this, or everybody always overlooks you, and everybody always treats me this way. God says love anyway. He loves so much that he would die for the people who would kill him. That's how much we love. So then we think of the the next, I think, logical thing is, okay, God is love. Love is from him. But what if I'm not convinced God is with me or, or cares about me? How can I know his love and his presence? I wonder if you ever feel that way, that God is just kind of separated from you. From you. Look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12. I'm just going to read the first part. He starts off by saying, no one has ever seen God. Now that's an interesting transition in these verses, right? And he's going to use kind of that same phrase in a, in a moment in verse 20. He's going to make a different point with it. But he starts off this next section, verses 12 through 16 that we're going to go through. And, and he says, he starts it off still talking about love. No one has ever seen God. Now, if you're just looking for some deep theological meaning, you may be like, huh, why did he write that there? But if you just kind of get in your, your own skin for a second and you start to think about some of the difficulty, maybe even why you might not care about a topic about God's love is because sometimes you feel like you don't see or feel God. 
Sometimes you wonder, could God love me? Does His love apply to me? Could He care about me? I, uh, I remember this time where I think my mom will be in next service, so I don't mind telling stories about my family. I always tell people also, you know, just be careful talking with me. Everything could be a sermon illustration. Uh, one, of my kids said, one of my kids did something kind of knuckleheaded, and the other said, be careful, he has the power of sermon. And so just always watch out for that. Well, I was a kid, and I, I was riding my bike, and well, I was learning how to ride my bike, and it was like first time without training wheels. And so, of course, the, the parent is helping it. It was my mom. I think she thinks it was my dad. My mom and I disagree about details of stories often. Pretty sure it was her. And so, so I'm riding my, uh, trying to ride my bike, and she's helping me along. And, and we come to this hill where I'm going to be going downhill. And I'm, of course, what all kids say, don't let go. Right? Don't let go. And so I'm going. I'm going down this hill, and I'm thinking I'm doing pretty good. And I look, and my mom had let go. And so I didn't crash. I put my feet down, and of course the, the deep sense of betrayal had welled up in me. And I just, I looked, you let go, you know, just in disbelief. And then of course the parent comes back and says, yeah, but look how good you did. You did so good. That doesn't ease my sense of betrayal. I still feel it deeply. Maybe you feel like that sometimes, that God is, he's the parent who let go. That he, he doesn't pay attention to you specifically, maybe to no one, but but maybe to you specifically. Or you know the sins that you've done, and so therefore you feel like deep inside you, how could he love me still? How could he care about me? It just feels like his presence is away from me. Now we talked last week as we went through the verses that preceded this about our anointing in the Holy Spirit and how we can absolutely grieve the Holy Spirit through sin, through failure to develop, things like that. And so step one, I would always just say, practice the spiritual disciplines, repent of sin, and and feel the Holy Spirit presence grow in your life. But sometimes even then, you just may feel like, does God really care about me? Does He love me? In fact, as we think about this book, the book of 1 John, written for the very purpose of helping us to have an assurance of salvation, a book of the Bible dedicated to the fact that sometimes we have doubts whether or not we're saved or whether or not God could care about us, whether or not God could love us. So how can I know His love and His presence when, as it says in verse 12, look at it with me, no one has ever seen God. He's going to give us five ways. I told you I had a lot of points today. If we love one another, it says, God remains in us, and His love is made complete in us. It's a great phrase. John uses it several times, this idea of being made complete. If we love one another, God remains in us, and His love is made complete in us. So he uses a couple just great words or phrases, this this idea of remaining in us. That's what we want. When we feel like no one's seeing God, I don't feel His presence, we want that word remain. It's the Greek word meno. It's used 118 times in Scripture, and 65 of those are in a combination of John and 1 John. That's part of John's mission, is to talk about God remaining in you. So he says, if we love one another, God remains in us. So we've talked about that. I've said that a lot. Those are what the preceding verses call you to. They call you to love others. And so one of the things that happens is as I love people, there's this assurance that is in me and also this outer sign that I love. But what it says here is his love is made complete in us. I wonder if you ever thought about what that means. This made complete idea. It, It can mean perfected, but really it's almost like there's this process that is completed. Well, what is that? If you think about the origin of Christianity, the beginning of it, how did Christianity start? Not in, not in Judaism, in the Old Testament. Of course, that has its roots as well. But Christianity, the only reason we can be called Christians today is because of an act of love. Love that said, I know you're a sinner. All those secret things that even the closest person to you doesn't know about, God knows all those things. He sees them right now if they pop into your mind at this moment and say, well, I hope the preacher's not one of those prophet preachers that he's going to call me out. There's someone in here with that sin. Don't worry, I'm not. God hasn't laid that on my heart to do that. But you're, you're sitting there thinking, here's why God may not love me. Here's why he may have a problem with me. Well, he already knew those things, and he died to save you from them. No matter how separated you feel from God, He died to save you from those sins. 
So then, when we love, it is the picture of this transformation. When it says his love is made complete when we love, it's a picture of a transformation that, that took love that took Jesus to the cross, now transferred to us the same love that would love others even when they're unlovable. That is the completion of the transformation process in us. This love that took Jesus to the cross, now we as Christians, because we've been changed by Him, would love others. No one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God remains in us, and His love is made complete. That evidence is in us. You can know you're His if He's changed you. Look at verse 13. This is how we know that we remain in Him and He in us. He's given us His Spirit. I talked about that a lot last week, so I won't recover it, but you can know by having His Spirit. Verse 14, And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son as the world's Savior. How else? No one's ever seen God. Will they testify of Jesus? One of the greatest evidences for Christianity is the testimony of the apostles who'd be willing to go to their own death saying, I've seen a resurrected Jesus. In fact, that's what First John starts out with. His, his first couple sentences of this book, verses 1-4 through four of chapter 1, he talks about their testimony that they have seen. They've seen this evidence. They, they've heard with their own, own ears, seen with their own eyes, touched with their own hands. He says, we are a testimony. We are evidence of Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't know if I can believe God. Well, His love's made complete in you. He's given you His Spirit, and we have a testimony that we can believe is true. And look at verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him, and he in God. Now, how is that an evidence? Because it's so easy. Now, now, easy may be the wrong word. It's simple. It's simple. To become a Christian is simple. Now, you end up having to die to self because you make him Lord, and that's, that's hard but it's still simple. It's simple, simple to say that I trust the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I make Him the Lord of my life. And if I do that, it says whoever's, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in Him and He in God. That's one of those verses that it's a promise from God. That God is saying to you, you who may sit there and doubt and, and worry, I feel like He's not near me. He says, trust my word. Trust my promises. I'm saying all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ and make Him the Lord or the authority of your life. You give your life to Him. It's not, sim it's not easy, but it is simple. So confessing Christ is a requirement to remain in Him. Now look at verse 16. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. It repeats it again that God is love. And he describes it by saying, we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. What he's saying to a, a Christian today, or maybe someone who's sitting here and you're not a Christian, is I love you. Believe it. Believe it. Sometimes it may feel like you're far apart from God, and maybe... Maybe that's something we do, that, that we're not in His Word, we're not in prayer, or there's unrepentant sin in our life, or, or we're not using our faith, we're not sharing the Word with others. And so maybe there's reasons. But also, even in those moments where, where we're not necessarily feeling His presence, His promises are still true. So the second point of your notes is God's love is abiding. God's love is abiding. Believe it. He's asking you to trust Him. That He loves you. He loves you enough to die to save you. So next question I want to ask is, what does God's love do for you? So, I need to care about it because it's His nature. It's from Him. It's His work on the cross. I, I, I can see that it can be helpful to me and, and, and it's near me because it's abiding. I have all these reasons to believe that that. His love's made complete. I have His Spirit. I have the testimony of the apostles. I have an easy confession, a simple confession to make. So I can see He loves me. Well, that doesn't mean that it does anything for me. I, uh, I started off this sermon series with talking about my son, 
Ezra, and I'll probably have to, he's not in here today, so don't, t- or he's not in here this morning. If it comes to next service, just don't tell him so I don't have to pay him money for using him in a sermon. My kids hold me to that. But I told this story of when my kids were upstairs and uh, him specifically, and it was just quiet, and it's that moment where parents are terrified and you're just worried what's going on. And so I sneak upstairs and, and he sees me, he's startled, he says, Oh, sorry, and so I know something's wrong. And I find that he has the glue on the carpet and, and walls and things like that. And so I know I've told that, I think, twice. But what it always, I always use this when I'm talking about eternal security and, and our stance before God. Because it's that father-child relationship that I think is most powerful for our hearts. To, to realize that God loves me like a father loves a son. He cares about me like, like I care about my children and infinitely more. And so in those moments when a kid does something like that, my other son, one time he, I don't know if your kids have ever done this, if you have kids, but he unrolled rolled an entire roll of toilet paper into the toilet. That's one of those things that you're just like, I actually don't know how to fix that. <laughs> it's just, they're just, what do you do? You can't flush it? Don't flush it. That's dangerous. How do, you, how do you take out a bunch of toilet paper that's falling apart because it's all wet? When our kids do something like that, they never stop being your child. They, feel, they fear discipline, but not banishment. They, they fear uh, dad's upset and something's going to happen and I'm going to be in trouble. But they don't fear that they're no longer my kids. That's an important point as we think of eternal security. Look at verse 17. As he's talking about his love for us, he's talking about the love that he demonstrates on the cross. Look at verse 17, it says, In this, love is made complete, he says it again, with us, so that we may have, what? Confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. That we could have confidence before him. Well, how could you say that? Look at verse 18. There is no fear in love. Well, how do I know love? Well, it's from God. And I love because He first loved me and He demonstrated His love for me by dying on a cross. And He says there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. Now, He's not saying you're not saved. He's saying you're not completing that process. The process started with love where Jesus Christ died for you, died for your sins. And then He says, My grace is sufficient for you. He says, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can have forgiveness of your sins. Through making Him Lord, confessing Him as Lord, believing in that death, burial, and resurrection, you can have forgiveness of your sins. And He says, trust me. You become my child when this happens. Believe me. To the person that sits there and wonders, how can I ever know that I'm saved? Believe that God loves you. Believe that He loves you and that perfect love casts out fear. Now, I always associate this with Romans 8, another great passage on eternal security. So look in your notes or on the screen. It says in verse 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. Do you hear what God's love should do? When you give your life to Jesus Christ, no matter what you've done, if you profess faith in His death, burial, and resurrection, and you make Him the Lord of your life, you are adopted by Him. You become a son and daughter of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe. You are transferred from the family of Adam, which only ends in death, to the family of God, which eternal life reigns supreme. He's asking you to trust in that work, but also trust in His love. Because, as it says, there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love dries out fear. And that's what we have a lot of times when we're talking about salvation, is fear. I worry that I didn't really mean it. I worry that I messed up and he won't forgive me. I worry that I'm, I'm too worthless. I, I, I've done too many things. How could he love me? How could he care about me? I hope you're hearing these verses today. 
In this, love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. That's how God wants his children to stand. Not arrogantly, not boastfully, not as if I've done it myself, but confident in his saving work, that he did it for me. So it's not about me. It's about me receiving him, me receiving his work. It's about him, his work, and his love that he did for me. So God's love is our calling, God's love is abiding, and God's love is our confidence. So what's the conclusion? Look at verse 19. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, so again he's dealing with people who are saying lies. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. Well, Paul, uh, John doesn't pull punches, does he? He's a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not sin, seen. So he uses the same expression, no one's seen God. And then he comes back to it and says, and let me make another point by this. You claim to love God, and yet you hate people, treat them with hate, Treat them as anything other than image bearers, as created in the image of God. He says, how can you say you love them when you, how can you say you love God when you haven't seen him and you hate the people who are made in his image that you have seen? So verse 21, the concluding point is, and we have this command from him, the one who loves God must also love his brother or sister. Final point of your notes is this, God expects you to, to love. Now there may be a person here today who is not a Christian, and I just want you to know how much God loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you find yourself today, you may have done just atrocious things, and you just say, how could God ever love me? You may feel worthless and beat down and broken. You may just feel desperate that I feel like there's no one in the world for me. No one cares for me. I'm telling you that God does. If it had been just you, God would have still died for just you. He loves you. Right there sitting in your chair, He loves you. And what He wants for you to do today is to receive His love through a a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe that you're a sinner and that sin separates you from Him unless you trust in Jesus Christ, that He died for your sins and rose again. And He asks you to place your trust in that death, burial, and resurrection And then to make him the authority of your life. We call it the Lord of your life. In a second, we're going to have a time of prayer where I'm going to ask the congregation to be praying for VBS and pray about anything in this message that you need to. Pray for someone in your life that, that needs Jesus. And during that time, if you've never trusted Christ, I invite you to come up and talk to me or there will be other, uh, other individuals up here that would love to talk with you. To the Christian John has it in here three times, and one of these is so lengthy, I probably was ill-advised to preach it all in one sermon. He tells us that he wants us to love, that it's God's nature, that it's his work, that it's abiding, that it's our very confidence in standing before him. Christian, God calls you to love. He expects it from you. He expects us to bite our tongue when something hateful wants to slip out. He expects us to forgive whether or not they're worthy of forgiveness. You, right now, if there's someone that you just have held on to something, you just say, I can't forgive that person. You don't know what they've done. God does. And even in knowing that, He asks you to love and forgive. Maybe you have a loose tongue that you just say anything to anyone or about them behind their back. And you just feel like that's the way I am. That's not loving. We have this command from Him, the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. Or maybe you're like me that you feel like you're just kind of an introvert and it's not like you dislike people, but sometimes you'd be better off just some nice space between you and other humans. God calls you to love, and love is an action. Love is something that we step out of our comfort zone, and I have to care that my neighbor may or may not know Jesus. 
I have to care about that. You have to care about that. We have to do something about a person next to us who doesn't know Jesus. So even though it'd be fun to stay in my comfort zone, or as I said at the beginning of this, it'd have been great if God didn't call me to be a preacher. But everything he says is true. And people really are going to hell apart from Christ. And your, ra- your neighbor or your coworker, they really do need Jesus. And just like love sent Jesus Christ from heaven to the cross, he asked you to love your neighbor in the same way, to be able to sacrifice whatever it is. Maybe it's your pride. Maybe you have to be in a, a little bit of discomfort. Maybe you have to risk someone getting angry with you and maybe persecution. Maybe, as some of the apostles found out, maybe even death. The question is, do we love? Because if you say, I don't have that feeling of love, okay, go have the action of love. Let's pray. Lord God, I lift up this message to you, and I pray for the person sitting here today that has not trusted you. God, this is the time where they can come down and speak to us. God, this time is open for them. I want them to come to know you. They could come, we have... We have Tim up here. Pastor Tim would love to talk to someone about Jesus Christ. I pray they come right now. Right now. No need to wait. They can come up talk to Pastor Tim. God, for myself and the Christians, help us love. Help us love the unlovable. Help us love the frustrating. Help us love with forgiveness and grace giving people the benefit of the doubt. Help us love with our resources by caring for others. Help us love with our time, our attitude. God, I pray there's a chipping away of anything that even resembles hatefulness or a lack of love right now. I pray the Christians right now They can come forward to pray or pray in their seats that this is a time of prayer where we pray that you help us love someone. I've been asking that we think of one person in our life who doesn't know Jesus or we're not sure they know Jesus. I pray that the Christians right now will begin to have a great and deep affection for that person that will help them take a step of boldness and begin a relationship so that they might lead that person to you. Help us love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand, please?